Welcome everybody to Dat Poker Podcast episode 115. It is December 10th, 2025. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside Roscoe P. Coltrane. Poker is nice. I love to play poker. Well, you have to be so mad. And Terrence Chan, T, how are you? Hello, hello. Doing well. It's uh, it's it's the days are getting shorter. It's getting a little darker. Yeah. Try to try to get some sunlight in my eyes, but it's it's getting mm-hmm. tough. I know where there is some sun. That is in Las Vegas, Daniel Negreanu. There's sun, but much like what Terrence said, it's getting chilly over here too. Cold to stay here. Look at me. I'm hoodied up. I got a hot tea. You know, I got I got furry socks on. Um, I mean, like I'm a wimp. I mean, I come from. It's, it's, a, it's like you're at the Rio again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. I put the put the but he's back on. But now it's getting a little chilly. Um, you know, that time of year, I guess. Winter. Down to about 60 to 65? Yeah, lower, I think. It was like 50. I walked the dogs for like two minutes the other day. I was like, nope. Turned right back. <laughs> like, the think, think the dogs or you? Yeah, I was going to say. Well, no, it was me. <laughs> the dogs are fine. They, they got fur. They're good. Says the guy who grew up in Toronto. I know. That was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh all right so let's jump right into a ton of stuff to get to um i'm excited i know the poker world is excited there's been some teasing by yourself daniel gentilly some others about uh season nine of high stakes poker being filmed right now in the poker go studios or was recently filmed this week um of course uh seasons one through six were uh, Gabe Kaplan, the golden years of poker on television. We had the edited ver- uh, one-hour versions of all the superstars and the bricks of cash and all the interesting hands. And then season seven, I think we went with uh, uh, Norm Macdonald and uh, took a little bit of a turn. Uh, season eight was uh, a relaunch uh, a, a bunch of years later in Poker Go last year, which was fantastic as well. But super excited about this one. Um, it looks great. The, the bricks of cash are back. Um, and uh, AJ and Gabe, of course, are back. So uh interesting daniel can you give us anything from the filming this week or is it uh, pretty much uh, uh lips are sealed oh, i can give you plenty i can give you plenty um i mean obviously you know subtle things number one we're going to see the biggest pot ever played on high stakes poker this season wow you are going hey, to see you involved I'll, I'll just leave it i mean i'll you know we'll be vague well, so I'll what are the blinds you. in that game and how big are pe- how deep are people playing um just to give us a sense of how big it might okay. get so the way high stakes poker went, it started out, you know, like there was about six days of shooting and we shoot for about eight hours, start two, 2 PM, go to nine. And then of course they edit that down into a few shows. The blind started out two and 400 with a $400 big blind Annie. Um, and then, you know, depending who's in the game, if you have JRB or somebody like that, there's a straddle that we play with a little bit of straddle. The second half, I would say, I think the second half of the sessions were 500, 1000 blinds with a $1,000 big blind Annie and a minimum buy-in of like 250,000. So, you know, pretty deep stack. Um, There is going to be one hand that you can all look forward to. I haven't told you what it is. I'd like to actually tell you guys privately. It's a, it's going to be a hand that people are going to talk about. It's between Phil Ivey, Patrick Antonius, and yours truly. Wow. Three-way pot that goes to the river. That is, uh, I think it's going to get the poker world really, really talking about, ah, ah, you know, everyone's going to argue about what the right play was and stuff. So, so there's definitely some interesting pots. We had, like you said, a, you know, really good lineup. There was plenty of people who sort of leaked some of the people that you'll see, but you'll see, of course, Tom Dwan, you know, he's, a, he's going to be a staple. You got Phil Ivey in there. You had Patrick Antonius. You had yours truly. You had Doyle Brunson. I tell you what, one of the days I played with Doyle, he just tweeted out that he had pneumonia. I don't know if you guys saw that. Doyle yeah. tweeted that he had pneumonia. He got about four or five days ago. It was an uncomfortable spot for me. We were playing. I was playing with Doyle. And he started, you know, sniffling. He started coughing a little bit. And then he starts telling me, you know, he's got headaches and he never gets headaches. And I'm thinking, you, you know, we got to get, you got to test yourself. I mean, you could, you could have it. Right. So Maury did give him a test that night. I was pretty convinced that he had it, but he didn't, I guess it's a a case of pneumonia. So hopefully he's doing well, but I'll tell you something about Dole Brunson. Um, For all that the modern game has, changed and evolved in terms of like theory fundamentally like he's obviously from a different era in that regard and not up to date but the guy just makes good decisions you know he just finds a way and at 88 years old for him to do that while playing props part of my favorite thing about playing high stakes poker is with phil ivy and Dole brunson because they are like brother and sister they catfight nonstop. they argue over everything it's like unbelievable uh for those of you that watch squid game uh, if you've watched Squid Game, you'll understand the marble game, okay? And in the marble game, uh, 
that I was like watching Phil Ivey with Doyle and Doyle's like, wait a minute, is that what I had? Phil is like, yes, that's what you had. He's like, oh, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. And I'm thinking marble game right here. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I trust Phil on this one, but it's really fun to watch them go back and forth. Um, it did prompt a tweet from me. Okay. Playing this week on high stakes poker and Mike Mattiso, of course, took it the wrong way. And I think we'll get to it, but it's about the idea behind you know, sharpening your skills, playing against the lineups. And maybe we'll just save that. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's get that later thing. Okay. So yeah. So what else from high stakes poker? They are real throwback set to the beginning. As you mentioned, bricks of cash yeah. are back. Um, the one thing we had to do with that, because obviously the gaming commission was like, no, no on cash. Right. Um, so what they had to do was we had to get very specific bricks pre-approved as cash and they can't be broken apart. So I can't break apart a 50 K and bet 20. Right. Basically, if I want, it's like a 50 K chip, if you will. So you had a guy from the gaming commission, like come and count down the bricks and no. then stuff them back in and verify them or what? No, no, no. They would, they just pre-approved specific bricks that, you know, we could all use basically as a prop, if you will. I mean, okay. it's still cash. It's all real money. It essentially is a cooler $50,000 chip than a one yeah. little chip thing. But I yeah. think part of the, the, the cash thing was, you know, exciting to people, like seeing the money on the table and the money passing through. Um, again, it is real money. It's, so it's, it's, you know, it's interesting to people. And I think that's a good thing to have back on high stakes poker. Everyone agreed. Most people are like, yes. It, it reminds me of, and this is different because you could be all of those, but the, the scene in Rounders where Mike McDermott is going around hustling with Worm and going out, he's in that golf game. And that, that guy cool, that like, brings out the pot, they're playing a like, pot limit game. He riffs off like $1,200 and just chucks it into the middle. I mean, people love that shit. Oh that's yeah, no, for sure. So I think it's going to be a good season. Um, you know, a couple different casts of characters. You got some, you know, businessmen, of course, because that's kind of like, you know, how the game runs right it would be very difficult to have just actually it's just more exciting actually when you have some players that are taking some unique lines but um i played about half the season and i won't tell you how i did obviously which you'll have to watch but i will say that i played some interesting hands with as i mentioned the one with uh patrick and phil and then a lot of people will be excited to see this because he's sort of been become a phenom on the live streams that's garrett adelson the g-man him and I, uh, when we locked horns, we played uh, we played some really interesting hands as well. Again, can't share them because that would like ruin the show. But yeah. I can I can just say this. But it's also important for people to know if you want to watch high stakes poker and you guys love the show, it's back, but it's behind the paywall of Poker Go. The only way you're going to see this show is to have Poker Go, and it's going to be worth it for that alone. I mean, it's like something like ten bucks a month, but it won't be like you know on the Game Show Network or anything like that. And you can save money by uh, using promo code Daniel, as far as I know. Um, I want to go back to quickly to um, Doyle and just, you know, so you're saying that Doyle can compete in this sort of hyper advance from, you know, where poker came from when he, when he started and he can compete now. Like it must have just been a complete slaughter when Doyle was. Yeah. yeah. Who said that? I think it was Phil Galfon who tweeted that. He's like, I would have loved to have seen 50 years ago. I mean, it must have been. And, and, and Doyle flat out said, he's like, yeah, I was like playing with people with their cards face off. Because I'll tell you what, and I won't name the player. But there is like a couple professionals, young professional, high limit, no limit players that in that game, I'd rather have a piece of Doyle than I would them. And I'm not kidding. Like, Why I'm is that? Really being serious. Is there tell boxes or because? No, because? no, because like the thing with Doyle is you're never going to have a bloodbath happen, right? He'll get his money in good. He'll just avoid the hands he needs to. He'll, he'll, he'll pick up pots, you know, here and there, you know, just to grind out, you know, like wins and stuff like that. It's a safer bet. And he won't be sloppy and he doesn't ever try to like be a hero, you know, which can be a syndrome we saw, you know, back in the day. And, you know, you'll still see someone today, but yeah, I really definitely want to get into, cause again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But the, the whole purpose of the tweet was me playing with some of the same guys that I played with, you know, a decade ago and having played against tough competition today in the high rollers and different things like that. Not only did it, so way back then, those guys, I, I was pretty convinced, you know, in a lot of cases, we're just better at, you know, high stakes cash than I'd be. And it's no longer true. And I think the big reason for that is obviously the work that I put in as well as, you know, sharpening my knife against really tough competition where, you know, bad hab habits can develop when you play against really weak lineups. All I feel time. like we got to read the tweet. I feel like we're going to do it now. Hang on, quickly, I just want to quickly say um, the lineup was really fun to watch. And so JRB's in there, uh, Bryn Kenny, Ivy, Durr. Uh, this is the photo that I saw. There was a businessman, Danny, yourself, Garrett Edelstein. 
um, and uh, and Jen Tilly. And, and I'm a huge Jen Tilly fan. I'm glad to see her in there because she makes great TV and she's fun to watch play. Um, and, and I imagine she probably takes some interesting lines as well as a businessman too. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry. So go ahead to the to the tweets. Uh, Terrence, you want to read those? Go oh ahead. yeah, sure. I've got it. So I'll put on my best Daniel Negreanu voice. It said, random poker thought. Constantly avoiding tough lineups is good for your bankroll in the short term, but long term, it will be difficult to improve as a player. Accumulating bad habits and not testing yourself can make you worse. And I assume, as you have alluded to, that this is in reference to certain people in the lineup who I'm, I'm sure you're not going to name names, but there are people that you th- that that used to be crushers that are no longer crushers. Exactly right, right? And they still may be crushers, right? They may be crushers in the games that they play. But I will tell you, there was one specific hand where one of the crushers made like a huge mistake, huge mistake in a pot, okay, against me. And at the end of the session says, yeah, I don't know. What, I just, I'm so used to playing against bad players. Right? I mean, it's easy to figure out, right? Like, I, with, I know you don't want to say it, Daniel, but uh, you think of somebody like Tom Dwan, who's playing in Asia against, um, you know, relatively soft competition compared to everybody else. And he's been there for a long time. And I'm guessing one of them is the people that we're talking about is Tom. And, and you know, he would probably admit that he plays against soft competition, comes back and plays against harder, harder competitions. Yeah. Different- uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to name names because it's yeah. not just one person. First of all, it was several. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, what's important to take from this is, and I somehow it got misconstrued by some people who read the tweet. I'm not suggesting that you go blow your brains out playing in the biggest game you can and losing all your money. That's not a, that's not a good idea. First and foremost, you know what? If you want to make money playing poker, avoid bad lineups. Protect your bankroll. You'll make a good living. Now, if you want to get much better, if you do want to play higher stakes and you want to, like, improve as a player and all that kind of stuff, if you never test yourself against good players, it's going to be very difficult for you to do. Imagine like, okay, so you, uh, you know, you're a minor league hitter and you hit only minor league pitchers. They're great. They're really good. You hit pretty good against them, but you've never, you've never faced the fastball from a major league pitcher, right? So who knows what that can do for you in terms of making you better. The, but the, the bigger thing is the, 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 the fact that you don't have to bring your A game in, e- in easy lineups if you're playing with like really weak players starts to develop bad sloppy habits, that if you were to play against tough lineups, and again, you don't have to, but if part of what you want to play poker for is because you want to improve and you want to get better, part of the ways to do that is not exclusively play in lineups where you're a dog. Don't do that. But every once in a while, take a small portion of the bankroll, 10, you know, whatever, small portion, and see how it feels to play against players that might be better than you. See what you pick up because you never know. You may pick up a nugget or two from a Jason Kuhn or a Steven Chidwick or, a, you know, one of these guys where you go, oh my God, you know, I never thought of that. And now I'm going to use that. And that's going to make me, you know, so then my EV against this spot was like a small investment into a lesson that I'm going to use to improve my game, you know, going forward. Now, obviously you could say that, you know, partly me playing against Doug was that, right? So I played against Doug when I was an underdog, obviously it's his specialty, but through that, like I just played against a really good heads up player for a very long time. My game improved immensely. So if I were to play somebody heads up, you know, <laughs> then I, I say that and I lost the fucking Phil help you, but, <laughs> but, you know, but like my game in general, my comfort level, you know, has, has gotten better. Now I'm, I'm fortunate enough where I can afford to do that. And I don't expect many other people could, but I would say that like, if you're a pro and you have aspirations of making a lot of money playing poker, uh, listen, unless you just, schmooze the right people and get in the right private games. Like you just never need to like a guy, like for example, Antonio, right. He doesn't need to ever be good at poker. He just doesn't need to. It's not an ego thing for him. He doesn't care to play against the wizards and stuff like that. He's got his game, makes his money and there's nothing wrong with that. So I want to make that clear for people that this is only for people like who really want to say, you know, like try to improve your game. One of the best ways to do that is face tough competition. And if you don't like, I just saw clear sloppy mistakes from some of my opposition some of the greats of their time that is so elementary now that we understand modern theory, like bluffs in the wrong spots, calls in the right, wrong place, just little things like that. But again, it's a complacency issue. Cause like, if you don't need to, you know, why would you, I get it. And it's really easy to fall into that. So, you know, I, I, I had a similar sort of thought or circumstance, you know, as you guys know, I played limit hold'em. I played really high stakes. You know, I play. I I took on all comers at limit hold'em for a number of years. 
But because I was doing so well at it, I never played anything else, basically. I let all my other games fall by the wayside. And I used to feel like I played like every game at least reasonably well. But, you know, my hourly at Limit Hold'em was great. I just kept playing it and I just kept playing it and I kept playing everybody. But for sure, these the rest of these games decayed. And then so when I got to a point in my career where I was like, where, well, eight people stopped playing me at Limit Hold'em. So that ha- started happening between like 2000 and uh, about after Black you know even before a little bit before black friday started happening but people stopped playing me at the game so now what do i do if you know luckily enough i I kind of made enough savings at that point i was doing well enough financially it didn't matter much i took you know regular jobs at, at ultimate poker and stuff like that but should i maybe have invested in playing other games because i mean even very recently i've been invited to like private games where they're playing they're playing mixed and i was like i i mean i know how these games work mechanically but like this game is decently big like i don't want to go off for like thirty thousand dollars like learning how to play a lot of these games i'm okay at them i mean i used to be pretty good at them um you know like i i, I used to be good at kind of all the games and then eventually that kind of became like like three games probably around like 2011 it probably came like limit hold them no limit hold them and and draw then like triple draw and then i just like i basically stopped playing eventually but I, but a, a big part of me wanted to wish I played all those games better. And then now like I'm at a point in my career where I don't play poker for a living professionally, but I still do like playing poker. I do like the idea of like playing lots of different games. Hell, I'd love to win a world series uh, event in a mixed, in a, in a mixed format in like a, in like a horse or an eight game or dealer's choice. Uh, if Adam, Adam Friedman decides not to win one, one year. Um, and, and you know, that it's, it's the same sort of idea as, mm-hmm. as what you're saying. It's, it's, it's not playing against uh, tougher players. Cause I was playing against the toughest players but it's putting yourself out there and challenging and developing a skill set so that down the road, because you never really know what future you want, right? Like right now, you're just thinking about the mortgage and the kids. Of course, then you're just going to play your best game, play against the, the softest lineup. But eventually down the road, who knows what you want, right? No, That's take, a great point. It reminds uh, me. Quick, sorry, Daniel, quickly, like Terrence uh, made reference to it. And back in the day in the Lemon Hold'em, you remember Party Poker back in like 2002, 2003, the limit hold'em games were incredible. It was free money. It was a cash machine. If you played and you had any idea what you were doing, you could do and you could four table the 30, 60 games, or you could go play small, no limit hold'em because that's where the future of cash games were going to be. And if you went and worked on your game, played much smaller and, uh, you know, started developing your game, you forego all this money you can make in limit hold'em myself. Like I was like, okay, well, I can go play and, you know, try and learn no limit hold'em to a degree, or I can sit here and play limit hold'em and just clean up. What am I going to do? And, and it's that investment theory about investing in yourself, investing in your game, getting better um, versus the immediate return of the money you could win in these limit hold'em games. And so it, it's exactly you got what you're describing is exactly what I used to do at the Mirage. At the Mirage, my regular game was like 20, 40, 40, 80 limit hold'em. That was my bread and butter that paid the bills. I'd show up. Sometimes there'd be no seat. So I would sit down in the 612 or 1530 stud game, right? So I'd spend a couple hours playing stud, learning the game. Some days I would sit in the, the 1020 Omaha high low game. I would sit in these other games, get little tastes. The other thing that I did, which I found the most beneficial because it's a fixed price, is playing these $100 tournaments where, yeah. you know, it was a $100 Omaha 8. All right, I'm going to play this and I'm going to get a lot of experience and I'm going to improve my game. Because, you know, part of what you like what you describe is, again, you never know what the game of the future is. Back in the day, stud was the game. So if you were a stud player, that's your game. Well, guess what? Stud's dead. Now what? Now what do you do? Much like what happened to Terrence. He's got no other action. So it was always worthwhile to keep your foot in the game. But, you know, that's sort of a sidebar of what I'm specifically, you know, talking about is that um, it's the same, you know, in the same game, right? Um, people's interests change. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it, it was just interesting for me to see, see in, with my own eyes, what happens when you take a great player and you surround him by seven really, really weak players, and that's the ones he plays with? How about this? And this, for those of you, of the, 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 you that golf, if you play with three guys who shoot 110, okay, or you play with three guys who shoot like, you know, 75, 80, what do you think happens to you, right? You play with 110 guys, you're sloppy too. I don't know. It sort of wears off on you. But when you play with the really good ones, you're like, oh, boy. You know, I got to get better. No, I mean, there's, no, there's no question about it. Obviously, playing against tougher competition is going to, you know, give you less. And the, uh, the question people ask is, and Robbie asked me in one of the tweets, what percentage should you play in tough games? Small, small. So, for example, when I would play the stud, 
I'd probably put in like two hours, one to two hours in the 1530 stud and about, you know, an eight hour session playing limit hold my bread and butter. Same thing I did with tournaments. They were like a treat and they were just a way to like, you know, learn on the edges. I want to ask you about these guys, these, these people who, whom you're referring to, do they care that they're not, you know, top of the food chain, no limit holding players, or are they just happy to be like, I beat up on, I beat up in a car. you mentioned Antonio was a guy just does not give a shit. He's not trying to be the best player, but I imagine a lot of these guys, they might've had egos and they were once upon a time that, you know, oh, considered the best. here's, you know, what the truth is, I don't think they know. Hmm. I don't think they know. How would they know? Right. Terrence, if you yeah. played in your home, right. And you just crush these guys all the time. How would you know you're not as good as some of these other people unless you played against them? You couldn't, right? Mm -hmm. So you might you might fool yourself into thinking, no, I'm the best. Why? Because I beat Larry the dentist, you know, and you know, you know <laughs> whatever. Good. Like, you, you, the, if you if you like, and I do believe at least in, in one case. Uh, well, again, I don't want to be too particular, but no, there's definitely for me. Um, I wouldn't say delusion, but there's just like a lack of realization or understanding. Uh, of how much, how far the game has moved along, passed from the stuff that, you know, people were doing 10 years ago or, or, or you know, the top players at the time that like, you know, there's just a whole group of new good players. And again, if you haven't played with them, that's why I value it. You know, when I play in the Super High Roller Bowls and I play all this stuff, I, I, I use them as learning experience. Like Michael Adamo busted me in a Super High Roller Bowl in the first 30 minutes in a crazy fucking hand. I dissected the shit out of that hand. I dissected shit. I've dissected the shit out of what Adamo is doing and what he's doing well and what areas I can learn from. And I think longevity, people ask me this all the time. Like, how do you stick around, you know, 20 years and still be relevant and still be able to play? Because I've always had a healthy amount of respect for my peers and what they're doing. Like, I think everybody right now, if you're a tournament poker player, you should be getting a poker go and literally watching all of Michael Adamo play. Maybe some of it's going to be like, what the, this is stupid. This is crazy. And that's okay. But fine, figure out for yourself. Why did he do that? What is his thought process? Why is he thinking outside the box? What types of things is he doing? And that's how you grow and learn as a player. You don't grow and learn as a player again, by playing against players who are thinking on a very basic level. Yeah. I think back to Prahlad playing cash and overbetting online. I think back to Alan Goring, min raising and everybody going, these two guys are idiots. They don't know what they're doing. And then, and then that's, kind of the road that poker went on yeah it's fast talking about it mm -hmm. yeah that, i mean there was a time too where i knew this i would defend my big blind like people would raise and i would defend my big blind because there's an annie out there with like nine ten off and eight ten off and i remember commentators saying well he's got a shove or fold here like, no actually the only correct play is call like i have nine ten off i have 12 bigs this guy just raised and i have to call like one more big if i flop a 10 or a nine i can get it in i can't get really outplayed but like commentators would say well you know he can't defend he can't call with this one he's either got to move in or fold no and like when i did that when i was calling with these hands people of the time said it was a mistake then the germans did some work to prove the theory behind what i was doing all along was correct and yeah, I think you even see that as a lot of mistake when you watch something like the World Series main event, you know, guys opening for 2.2 or even just 2x in the field and people defend folding very playable hands in the big blind heads up. I think people get in trouble multi-way over defending their big blind and no limit. But I think that's still a problem among amateur no limit players is that they don't Speaking defend their big blind enough because you're getting you're getting a huge price. Speaking of something I learned, right? Something I learned from watching some of the last poker masters or whatever. And I noticed a lot of the guys who are in the Solver Street studying. They were folding their big blind in spots from like, huh, when it was raised and called mm -hmm. as the third yeah. player from the small blind or whatever. I saw Chris Brewer, for example, against a raise and a flat, he folded Jack 10 off in the big. And I was really surprised to see that. Um, but then when you take a deep dive, you know, and, and you really break it down, it's like, okay, well, that's certainly like, meanwhile, he's calling with like Jack six offsuit against one player, but he's folding Jack 10 now for the same price. And again, it comes down to, how the hand plays against, as you said, you know, more than, more than one opponent and it just doesn't do quite as well. So that's one little leak that I probably plugged just from, again, that's another thing Adrian Mateos does too. A lot of people think, Oh, you know, Adrian, you know how he learns? He watches everybody else, he sees what they're doing. He figures, well, shit, that must be something. You know what I mean? I'm sure they figure. I'm sure the solvers approved of those things. So let me do it and just let me find a way to do it even better. It's actually more entertaining. It's a lot more entertaining than sitting there in Pio and waiting for the shit to fucking grind too. Like let's input all of our ranges that this guy would have in the three off the button. Let's input all of the ranges and let's sit there and hit the go button and wait for it to grind. It's a lot more right, fun. That's not something. I, Cause I said, most of the work that I did on my game was heads up. Yeah. So I just extrapolated what I learned from that to, to ring game. But like, 
I mean, I've not spent any time on multi-way pots, but that one was one that I saw as a recurring theme. Nick Shulman actually mentioned it. He said something to the effect of like, he said, and I love it because Nick Shulman's just so smooth, silky. He talked about collecting ideas. You're just collecting ideas, right? So you're seeing this thing like, okay, interesting. So you collect ideas, you add to your repertoire. And that's another idea. I'm like, all right. So maybe the king nine off against the raise in a flat, even though, you know, my hand is like decent. What am I up against? that flatted, that has me dominated like far too often where I'm actually going to, my imply, I have reverse implied odds with the King nine off in a big way. So, so anyway, just uh, interesting, you know, thing about learning and I'm always learning and I'm always growing and I see others again, my age or whatever, who are not, and they're stuck in their old ways. Like I actually, I swear to God, I spoke to Mike Madison on the phone for an hour yesterday and I, was, and I really, but he was actually receptive trying to learn stuff, but he's so stuck in his like old school brain that just doesn't allow him. Like I tried to explain to him how often his cards are face up. He's like, well, I just got to protect the pot. You know, like there's a lot of spots where he goes all in on the flop. I'm like, but dude, you're never bluffing, right? He's like, yeah, but I just, you know, I pick up what's there. I'm like, yeah, but people just play perfectly against you and you give up EV. He's like, well, I just got to protect my stat. You know what I mean? Like he takes it to an extreme and it's very difficult for, uh, you know, older guys that, that are not willing or just willing to embrace sort of new school theory, it's very difficult for them to wrap their head around, you know, doing things differently or upgrading their game. Uh, you guys mentioned it a little bit. Uh, the World Series of Poker Europe just happened. And I want to quickly touch on a couple of things there. Um, first off, you know, we talked about it in the last episode, I think, and numbers were down a little bit. And there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, people that went over COVID concerns right up against the World Series, etc. Um, but uh, there was a uh, live stream uh, of the a World Series of Poker. Well, and actually, the main event was the biggest main event ever. The biggest World Series of Poker main event ever. Biggest, sorry, World Series of Poker Europe main event? The, the biggest World Series of Poker Europe ever. ever. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Good. So, uh, yeah, that's awesome. I, I didn't realize it got that big. I, I'd stop. I don't know. I guess I'd stop following it. But um, one you guys caveat, were... of course, there was one re entry available. So that's how they got to 680. Oh, I see. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, Uniques wasn't. Uh, it didn't break record. It was total entries. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Um, so, but there was an interesting uh, live stream and uh, Daniel, you were on the panel, uh, the muck, and it was um, Ali Najad hosting yourself, David Williams and Brett Hanks. And you guys were doing in between breaks, you guys were commentating on a lot of the, uh, the different play that had happened. And I thought it was a great format. I enjoyed it. Um, a lot of fun. You guys were, uh, uh, you know, ripping guys and talking about the, the, the play and it, was, it went really well. It looked like a, a lot of fun to shoot too. Yeah, so this has been in a sort of sort of, we've been brainstorming this idea, you know, over at GG for quite a while, and they put a lot of effort into this. If you saw how many people were working on this set, the set was very sleek, it was very modern, you know, with the white background, very, very cool and hip, kind of what we were going for. You know, we did a pregame, and of course, as you mentioned, each break, we were just, you know, really trying to, you know, dig in, and we've got bigger ideas for it, but like, we're, we thought about creating content in a different way, right? You know, rather than just the simple break desk that we always have. Um, something a little more exciting, a little innovative, and a little bit more like engaging, a la, a la kind of what TNT does with, you know, Shaq and, and Charles, and now the NHL, of course, is doing. We thought, well, what if, you know, because of me, Ali's great, Hanks is fun, David, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good cast of four where we can sort of like go back and forth. And I think unanimously, people really, really love the format. So it's something that we're going to, you know, do bigger and better even more in the future. But it was really fun to be a part of. It was one of the best broadcasts I've ever been a part of from that perspective. Um, yeah. And I, I, I really do think like, again, obviously it, ha it started early in the morning for people here. So maybe not, all, not everyone got to see it, but I think going forward, you know, the muck is going to be something that is going to be like appointment television. And maybe we'll do even more stuff with it because it was a really, we had good chemistry really right off the bat for our very first show. Every segment felt like it was smoother and more fun than the last. Yeah. It was interesting to watch for sure. Um, one of the things that came out of it was, of the pace of play. And I think you tweeted, Daniel, where you talked about the fact that they played 17 hands an hour. Um, how painful was that to watch as you're sitting there commentating on it? Well, they prompted another tweet. We got the DNA tweet again, um, <laughs> where I think it's important. I think it's very, very important to be clear that you cannot blame the players at all. You cannot blame the players for playing slowly. That is not the place where it goes. In the NBA, when a team was up nine, nine points, with two minutes to go and a guy just held the ball, you cannot blame the player. He's making the correct strategic decision to hold the ball because he's going to win the game and there's nothing you can do about it. What needs to be updated is the rules themselves, right? 
the players are all playing within the rules and they're doing what's in their own financial best interest. Same is true with the bubble or everything. So um, I tweeted out something. I don't know if we want to read it or not. Sure. Go for it. Or, or yeah, you, you're not going to read your own tweet. So I'm going to do this one. Terrence, who did the other one. Uh, the World Series of Poker Europe main event final table uh, averaged approximately 17 hands an hour. The players are playing within the rules and they're not to blame. It's time to learn from chess and implement chess clocks. Uh, Poker has evolved. The answer is to update the rules. A shot clock is an okay compromise, but it unfairly harms players who don't waste time on mundane decisions and benefits those who would always act at the 32nd mark. The chess clock fixes that and can be done. So let's quickly stop on that. The differences there between a chess clock and, and the current thing is you have a set amount of time for all your hands versus you have a set amount of time for this hand. Right. So look at it this way, right? If the idea is this, right, you know, you want to sort of, um, you, you want to promote the idea that people should play more quickly, right? But if there's no difference in terms of what happens to you if you act within five seconds or 30 seconds every time, right, you get no benefit there. So the guys who take 30 seconds for every decision, meanwhile, let's say I fold immediately, right? Well, if on the river I need more than 30 seconds, I pay a fine, which is a time bank. This guy pays a fine. It's equal, right? Even though this player is way more egregious, right? So for example, let's say, you know, for 10 hands in a row, this or whatever, for 10 hands in a row, you know, this player takes the full 30 seconds to fold. He's just burned five minutes of the clock, right? Meanwhile, on the river, if he needs 35 seconds, it's exactly what the same as what I get when I didn't burn any of that five minutes. So it unfairly, it unfairly punishes those that act quickly and actually need a couple minutes to get a read on the river, but they don't have the luxury of deciding when they get to use their time. And the guy who just decides, I'm going to stare at the flop and wait 30 seconds before I act, like there's no punishment for that, right? If you incorporate a chess clock, which you can continue reading uh, the tweet if you want. Yeah, you can segue into that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So let's uh, back to the tweet, uh, the third tweet of four. Every two hours, players have a fresh five-minute clock played on an iPad app at the table. After five seconds, whoever it's on will have their clock start. They can use this time however they wish. If they run out, their hand is dead. If the player uses up all this time, uh, he will have 15 seconds. He or she will have 15 seconds to act on all decisions for the remainder of the two-hour period, and then all player clocks are reset to five minutes. This would make time a commodity, and punish those who waste it. Right. So now directly, if a guy does that, right, where he just takes 30 seconds every time. Okay, well, now he's in a big spot. He needs to make a big decision. But he's only got, you know, 17 seconds left on his clock. Now he's been punished. And a lot of people are like, well, five minutes isn't enough and this and that. But here's the thing. You're never out, right? Because you're always going to have for the remain. So let's say, for example, you used your whole five-minute clock in a two-hour period. That probably happens maybe 90 minutes in. So you have to play for 30 minutes where you get 15 seconds to act for every decision. That's you a lot can, of time. 15 you can seconds play is poker. a lot of time. You can play poker just fine on 15 yeah. seconds alone. So it's not that egregious, but but here's what it, it does and what I like about it is it's specifically, it's it basically now, like as I said, time is a commodity. Those guys that have seven deuce offsuit under the gun and just stare and look around or whatever, okay, they're paying for that. You know, they're paying real time. Now, there are obviously some logistical things we have to massage in terms of bubble play and stuff like that, because, you know, around the bubble, people, you know, all the short stacks of five minute clocks will just, you know, burn their whole clock, which kind of happens anyway, you know, and then as far as the app you would need in an iPad, it's very, very easy to do. It's no different. Oh, it's too, just, it's no different than what dealers already do now when we play shot clock tournaments where they just, you know, press the button when it's on the person's turn, it would require a pause button, right. And then just a start button. That's it. And then it goes around the table. Well, what happens if a player moves from table to table? Okay, that's fine. He moves from table to table. He gets a five-minute clock. You know what I mean? He's not choosing to move. It's like he's been moved. So whatever. The key thing is this. All about all this stuff, it's not some massive advantage. Oh, my God, totally unfair. This guy got an extra 44 seconds, right? It's not cheating the game. It doesn't change the game. All this does is it holds everyone accountable and equally fair. Everyone's given the same amount of time. Uh, you know, to act on their hand. People are saying, you know, well, what, what if you have a really big spot? Okay, you get five minutes. You get five minutes to act on your hand. That's plenty. And then again, if you've done that and you're at zero, you make it to the end of the level, you got your five minutes back. So you can use a ton of time. And it, it, But again, the, the, the key thought I have on it is at having played shot clock tournaments, I do feel like they're unfair to players like myself who will act very quickly. But then on the river, kind of, I sometimes want to get a read on a guy and 30 seconds doesn't do it. 
for 30 seconds, someone holds their composure, they don't move, but maybe after about a minute, minute and a half, you know, they break, right? Well, for me to do that, I have to make the decision to like lose some of my commodity of time. Whereas if I had a five minute clock, I could choose to use my time however I want. So I could act very quickly pre-flop and on the flop so that by the river, you know, I save time when I think it's most valuable and most important. So when, sorry, just quickly, when you say, and I know there's people out there who are casual players and they're always talking about tells. And when you say that player breaks after 30 seconds, what specific things do you mean when a player breaks? Like he can't hold his composure any longer. What specifically happens there? Okay. So again, everybody's different, right? But let's say you're playing against the guy and he's just stone faced. He's not moving, right? Well, sometimes the pressure gets to him. You're still tanking. It's a minute. Now maybe he sips his drink. Now maybe he tries to act casual. Now maybe he releases the chips. Maybe now he stops shuffling his chips. Maybe now he gulps. Maybe now he try. Maybe he says something. Maybe he smiles at a comment that you made. There's a whole bunch of variable things that within, here's the thing. The first 30 seconds, I'm thinking about the damn hand. Well, what the hell? Okay, so you check raise flop. He has this, he has combos, blah, 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 blah. That's barely enough to do in 30 seconds. So that doesn't leave me much time to be doing that while also spending time on a read, right? So yeah, it's, it's very easy for somebody to hold their posture for 30 seconds. It's very hard for somebody to hold their posture for three minutes and give away nothing. I have a lot of thoughts on this. I mean, almost all of them are in line. I want it to be a thing. I want it to happen. Um, logistically, I have concerns about how it happened. My first thought is actually like, I, if somebody uses all their time, I actually think 15 seconds is too much. Just fucking get them down to seven because otherwise you just get these, these pre-flop fuckers who, like you said, look at seven deuce offsuit under the gun and pretend like they're doing something. And I'd like to punish them more, but that's me. But how do we actually do this? How do we actually get all the iPads and the tables who is going to do this? It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost poker tournaments um, to do this, to put this in. You know, is, is, the world, is it going to be done at the World Series of Poker? You, know, you mentioned, oh, it's not hard for the dealers to do the shot clocks, but we have dealers who can barely deal the game. Um, it, you know, like what kind of scale can we realistically implement this? Because right now, the only reason, the only place we have time banks is in, for the most part, in, in high roller tournaments. How do we get this on a grand scale? How do we actually get it implemented? And if somebody does it, they get my vote for next year's Poker Hall of Fame, even yeah. though I don't get one. Well, here, here's how you started, right? I, I believe a, a gradual progression. As you said, the best test round available is the high rollers that we have at Poker Go Studio. We can actually just adopt it there. Now, for bigger tournaments that have like 1,000 players, I see the concern, having 1,000, you know, 100 iPads, all this sort of stuff. So what you could do is you could start it either at just the final table or the final three tables, where the iPads come out for the last three tables or even just the final table. Um, and, you know, some people would push back and say, well, you know, it's not fair to play a tournament one way and then switch. The WPT's already done that. You know, down to 36 players, they implement their action clock, right? So people are becoming more accustomed to this. And here's the thing. Like I said, the game has to evolve. The issue is this, right? Back in my day, it didn't take more than 10 seconds to make a decision because you knew what you're going to do. But because a lot of people are using modern poker theory, doing the calculations takes sometimes about 40, 45 seconds to get it roughly right, right? So without a shot clock, we've just got a game that's much slower because people are playing it better. So we have to do something. And I don't, I don't love the shot clock as the answer. I think it's like I said, it's decent for now, but a chess clock going forward, um, again, starting small, just do it at the final table, right? Here's the deal at the final table. You guys all get this, you know, obviously on GG in the software, you know, we have tournaments where at the final table, you know, everyone gets a clock. Your clock is adjusted based on how much time you, you, you spent, you know, leading Would GG up. start one from the, the start of the tournament. Have they, have they done any ones where you have a clock from the beginning of the tournament yet? Uh, no, I mean, no, no, not a chess clock. It's just, you know, like your regular time bank situation, but I mean, that that seems like the most obvious place to, to give your, the idea a try, because if the software is already in place for the final table, and it he, shouldn't be that the thing. Here's the thing. If people are, you know, if there's the pushback about it affects the play too much, I personally think five minutes won't affect the play at all. But if you don't, if you don't think that works, you could even do 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. The point is this, is yeah. that the point is, is that, that it is a commodity of some sort. So when you waste it, you lose it, right? In actual chess, you, if you're the first one out, and we actually did this in Korea, GG had a live tournament where they used uh, for heads, they use a shot clock. Uh, they used a chess clock. And, but the rules were, and I kind of think this is cutthroat and I love it. If you're out of time, you, you're out. <laughs> you, you just, okay, let's do it. Let's do like it. Like in chess, in chess, I play 10 minute games all the time. Sometimes like I have a winning position, right? The flag. But I've run out of time and I lost the game. 
right? Similar to, imagine a heads up tournament where, you know, you have like an eight to one chip lead, but you've only got like seven seconds left on your clock. You know, you know what I mean? And if you time out, you just lose, yep. right? That's going to force the other guy who would smartly play very quickly because that's what happens in chess as well. So point being is currently the idea of having players police this by calling clocks is not working. Okay. No. It's never worked. It doesn't work. It creates animosity. It shouldn't be on the players. They're not the police officers, right? It creates a bad blood. Like if I were, I do it because I don't give a fuck. Right. But most people feel uncomfortable about it, even when it's egregious. So I, I, I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is if shot clock is the, is the compromise, that's fine. But I think the chess clock is a much better option. Uh, all right. Uh, just on. make it happen. Just fucking make it happen tomorrow. I'll play up fucking bring it back. Bring it in as soon as possible. Put it in my veins right now. <laughs> Parents, we've been ready. talking about this for a long. I'm ready. I'm ready. I, yeah, yeah, I've been ready for this. I've been ready for this for like 12 years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we need the we need the correct solution for sure. Uh, all right, uh, moving on. The uh, WPT uh, at Bellagio uh, event happened, and uh, numbers were down. Um, and you know, uh, I don't know if this is a reflection on the World Poker Tour. I don't know if it's on uh, the Bellagio. I don't know if it's you know because the World Series ran so. Uh, late this year, uh, Daniel. What are your thoughts here? First off, on uh, on the WPT Bellagio turnout. So here's the thing: the WPT Five Diamond Bellagio tournament was always sort of the pinnacle in poker. It was like very prestigious. You know, it had a higher buy-in at one point. Fifteen thousand has ten. It's the one with the unlimited re-entry, but it's one that always people really enjoyed. There was a lot of nostalgia. Me and Amanda, I remember playing in the Fontana Lounge. It was very nice in there. It was really clean and comfortable. And obviously, you know, with the Fontana Lodge closing. They moved into the poker room. Then you have like a spillover of tables in the sports book. Not, you know, it's kind of dark, not the best experience, or whatever. But what we're seeing, and I think a lot of people are, are starting to see, is kind of the demise, really, of the center of the poker universe being the Bellagio. A lot of people I've spoken to, I've never been there, love playing at Resorts World. So it's fantastic, really well kept. Aria has games, Venetian, The Win, they're all running tournaments where it appears as though, like, for example, I tweeted out, I couldn't find fucking anywhere. All I wanted to see was a structure for the five diamond. I just wanted to know. So I know like what time to show up, how long I got to re-enter, all this kind of stuff. Couldn't find it anywhere. I found one from 2017, asked, and apparently I tweeted and people said, we've been asking them for months and there's nobody home. There's nobody, you know, there's nobody like on the pulse of it. Nobody really like putting in the effort. And this sort of, if this is true, I think Daniel Strauss tweeted this, that they are set up for this, for this five diamond for 260 players. Okay. It's going to get, you know, it's, it's always gotten close to a thousand. So what does that mean? A whole boatload of alternates because they just don't have the room. So for those people that would, you know, want to, you know, you know, rebuy, you might have to go back in the line or something like that. So I'll probably show up right on time and try to build a stack myself, but it's, uh, I mean, it, you know, things change, right. But at this point, there's so much competition in Las Vegas now for good poker rooms that they have lost their foothold. Like they don't have, all like, you know, people like have taken games like Bob, you know, say JRB, he plays this game over at Daria, you know, in that private game over there, a bunch of the mixed game players, you know, they moved over to resorts uh, tournament wise, you know, the win, everyone loves playing there, Venetian, stuff like that. So the experience for the player has appeared to me based on the feedback I get from a lot of people and, and the numbers like Jeremy bought into like the $1,600 PLO. He said there was like 16 players. This is a very popular format. He's like, shocked that the PLO players around town couldn't be pried away or didn't know or wasn't promoted or whatever the case may be, but something's going on there. And I don't know if I, I really don't know because I haven't spoken to the manager there. Or whatever. I don't know how much they do care, but if they do, they're at a point where the brand has to do some di brand damage repair, right? Because again, people are taking their business elsewhere. It seems. So what it would be That's interesting, right? Because all those places you mentioned, the Aria is a fantastic room. The Wind's a fantastic room. I haven't been to Resorts World. People are saying that like Resorts is like the nicest poker room they've ever played in. Like people sitting there for the first time, they're they're just blown away by it. I, I mean, from everything I hear, it's amazing. Oh yeah. yeah. So and the book, the Bellagio is a great room too, right? I mean, even John, look, angry John Monet, who's angry about everything. He said Not anymore. He, no, I know he's my, and now he's a kid. Now he's a daddy, so he's better. But yeah. Yeah. but even you know he said to me, and I know he, he for, for a guy like him. He complimented all the dealers because he said, you know what the dealers, he's like, when I tell them something, they just listen and they hear me and they say, thank you for pointing that out. But you know, like it's John Monet will say something like release the deck or whatever. And sometimes dealers give him attitude. Like what? 
He's like, do the fucking procedure right. You know, and then, you know, angry John, he just lost he's a stickler the for like small things. Very, right. very the small thing things. Is, the thing about John is he's always fucking right. Like yeah. every time he says something, he's right. But like he noticed the, and I, I do believe this is a thing. I, I'm having worked in the business world somewhat for a, lo- a decent amount of time. I really do believe it genuinely comes from the top. Okay. It comes from the top. The owner of that place, whoever he is, mandates kindness, generosity, customer friendly experience for all the players. And it trickles down to everyone from, you know, like the higher ups to the dealers, to the guys sweeping the floors. And that's the environment people get there. They, they, and again, I've never been there, but I can't, I can't believe how many people have told me the exact same thing about their experience going there from the food options, to everything else. But like in general, their willingness to accommodate, you know, poker players, it's reminiscent of what you know, Benny Binion did way back when the horseshoe was, when, when the world series first started, he used to have like this huge buffet of rattlesnake and deer and crocodile and all this fucking exotic <laughs> shit. But you know, people appreciate it and they loved it. And he did that understanding that by doing this, Binion's becomes everybody's favorite casino. And that's where they're going to give their action because they feel it's like a loyalty. Right. So right now resorts world is like the hot new kid on the block. They're doing all the right things. Um, and, you know, Bellagio either has to, like, shit or get off the pot in terms of trying to it'll, win the pot. It'll, it'll be sad if, if they do just if, – if nobody cares the Bellagio anymore because it does, does end up being a poker room and they just put some slot machines in it and all that time because – We've we've nostalgized the Rio a lot. I think over the last two months, we've talked about you know the Rio and the World Series poker and the memories that we'll have there. But I think I mean all three of us certainly we we played put in a lot of time at the Bellagio. And for me, it was my first real Vegas poker room. I mean, I was twenty, I think, uh, when I first played poker in Bellagio. Don't tell anybody. Um, but you know, back when there was still smoking, right? So that's how I know it was before uh, two thousand and one. There was still smoking in the Bellagio. But yeah, I mean, I I remember I used to play like eight sixteen at the Bellagio and look up at the high limit section where you probably were at the time, Daniel, and think like, man, I wonder if I'll make it up there one day. I wonder if I'll have the chops played up there one day. The first time I played in the high limit section at the Bellagio, I was like, oh my God, I'm here. It's amazing. like, I have, I have a lot of nostalgia uh, for that room. And I, I would be really sad if they just paved over it and, and put slots well, in there. It's funny. Well, you, what you describe about the Bellagio was my experience with the Mirage. Mm-hmm. When I came up, the Mirage was the place. And I mean, the smell of it, the dark colors. It was like a real poker room. And we went to Bellagio. It was a little more colorful, a little more fruity, a little more. Like, it didn't feel like the same thing for me. So, you know, I had nostalgia over Mirage and I still do. Like, I mm-hmm. remember. Because, again, it also impacts you when you're young, you know. Like, yeah. I, was going, I was going there with an $800 bankroll, sitting down in 2040, hoping things would go well. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, there was like, and there were many walks home, back to the budget suites, like, thinking, what am I going to do with my life, right? Um but yeah, the Bellagio, I've certainly had plenty of nostalgia there too. And listen, we're, we're talking about it like it's a grave. It, it's not going to be gone or anything like that. But I do think they're at a precipitous point right now where um, they are seeing significant impact to you know, their brand in comparison to what else is out there. And that's always going to happen, whether it's online poker, any industry, the new kid on the block, people start treating them better. You know, that's, that's like the win. I think that's part of the reason everyone likes playing tournaments there. They just they love everything about it. Terrence and I have that nostalgia about the Holiday Inn on Broadway. <laughs> no, I definitely, there was no game to look up to. The problem with the Holiday Inn is you had you had your your one table of five ten and your three tables of ten twenty. It didn't matter how many racks you won at ten twenty; you were still playing ten twenty. That's the problem. <laughs> Remember when FBT would buy in for six racks and come over and and put six racks on the table and just pretend oh. like he was the biggest shot in the world? It was so fun. In, the, in a 10, 20 limit hold'em game, you'd have to yeah. keep buy-in for $3,000. <laughs> that was the best. Uh, I live like a block away from there now. Yeah, you're very close. That's right. No games there anymore, but uh, back in the day there was. Even Daniel, I think, stuck his nose in those games uh, here and there once in a while. But uh, All right, uh, moving on to uh, a bit uh, sadder news. Um Poker Pro, or former Poker Pro at least, uh, Dusty, Leather, uh, Dusty Schmidt uh, passed away at 40. He was known as Leatherass. Um, really was one of the guys who first started, um, you know, putting in a ton of volume and, and, uh, and you know, doing challenges and doing things like that. Uh, he had some health issues all the way along. He was a very, very good golfer. I think he was, you know, plus two or something. He was supposed that. to make the, the PGA Tour or something, and then he had a heart attack, I think is my yeah, understanding. Yeah, he had some health issues. Um, you know, uh, yeah. I'll, you know, you don't want to say bad things about somebody who passed away. And, and I didn't agree with a lot of stuff that Dusty said, uh, but uh, he, he certainly contributed to the poker community in a large way. 
um, both in content and, uh, you know, controversy, you had people talking and, uh, and certainly put in volume, but uh, sad that, you know, health issues seem to have got the best of them. Yeah, there, there was a time, I don't remember the period where you could just log on to PokerStars and if, if there was a single, like you could not find a game like over around like two, four, five, ten, 10, no limit that didn't have him in it. Yeah. It was incredible. Like it was just, I couldn't believe that the, the volume that this person played and um, Kev math actually like um, linked a, a tweet or excuse me, Kev math tweeted an old link. I think it was like a card player column, but it's in like the art, it's in the web archives. If so, if you Google like, Kev math and leather ass or something, you might find it, but it's about, he wrote a, a long piece about how his brain had uh, been affected by online poker, like all these years of playing like, like, you know, 12 tables at a time, online poker, just so many hands day in, day out. There's, you know, he saw like some of the top neurologists in the world who examined his brain. And, you know, he actually had a doctor tell him like, Hey, if you do this, you're going to, you're going to die at 50. Like if you don't, if, if, if you just keep playing poker, you're going to have like a stroke, but you're guaranteed to have a stroke by the time you're 50, because the brain is just not designed to like take these chemicals in and chemicals out, just work so hard and process so much. You know, Daniel just talked about, you know, the, all the things that you go through when you're facing like, you know, a tough, no limit decision, you know, he was doing this hundreds of times per hour. Your brain is not designed to do that. I've, I've heard of other people who just put in tremendous volume too. And they, they tell me they can't sleep at night. There is a downside to all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's hard and we're, we're starting to, to see all this, but yeah, it's really sad. Um, you know, the cause of death is not known. So we definitely shouldn't speculate on it, but this is a guy with, with health issues, unfortunately. And it, it gutted me to see that he had three kids um, at, and that, at the age of 40, that, that he passed away because of, obviously that, that hits close to home for anybody who's a dad. And it just seems awful. Like 40, 40 is younger than I am now. I, I can actually say that. Um, and yeah, that's, it's terrible. That was quite sad. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, tweets, Roscoe, we, we just have uh, a couple quick ones. Go for it. You're going surfing on the internet. Uh, Brian Altman tweets, uh, what's the best way to tell someone to play faster without actually calling the clock on them? And uh, there's a bunch of, responses, uh, you know, you tell them to hurry the fuck up and that kind of thing. Uh, but there was a funny one and it was uh, uh, Sean the Human. He's, he replied and he said, I usually just ask Jordan to play faster. <laughs> Jordan Christos. Uh, you know, I, 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 that's a, it's a fair, I mean, I'm surprised it's even a question. Like, how do you do it? Like for me, what I do, and this is my plan going forward, is I let people know. Like if I see a guy, you know, taking too much time, I just let him know. I'm like, hey man, nothing personal, but like, you know, you take a little more time than normal. So like when you need it most, um, you're going to get an early clock from me. Right. Either like either a, either a, you act quickly in these mundane decisions and then I'll leave you alone when you have two minutes, three minutes on the river, or because you're wasting 40 seconds every time at, you know, when you're, it's an all in versus, you know, someone's moved all in on you for your tournament life. I'm going to call clock. And this is just simply because he's not, you know, if you're not really showing courtesy to the rest of the table in that regard, then, you know, you don't, you don't get it from me either. Right. And it's not, again, it's not personal. I respect everybody's right to play within the rules, but part of the rules include my ability to call the clock and do so as I see fit. Obviously the question comes then to the dealer, was this player given a reasonable amount of time? And I think there's a problem with that. What the hell does reasonable mean? Yeah. Right? What does reasonable mean to you, to me? You have, a, you, you have a dealer sometimes who like they're on their like second week on the job. How, how the hell are they supposed to know what's a reasonable amount of time when there's a four flush and the guy bets three ox spot? Like, like, you know what I need? Yeah, I need to know. It's like, if you're if I'm the dealer in the box and someone says, you know, is it a reasonable amount of time? And I'm like, can I see his hand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, can I see what he has, right? If the guy has like, fucking, you know, a big hand and a weird spot, you know, sure, take your time. But if it's like, he just has fucking nothing or he has the nuts, like, dude that's not a reason really, yeah you know what i mean like you need that information so yeah so again for me like i think what i'm going to do going forward and again maybe at the bellagio i'll do this instead of what i was doing before is i will let know i will let specific guys know that they're on that clock with me like when when they most need it they're going to be restricted in terms of time if they choose to you know to do that and if they don't if they if they if they speed up i'll say you're you know you're off my quick clock I think that's a fantastic way of approaching it. It's much more mature than me because I just kind of roll my eyes and say, fuck, man, come on. Um, yeah, I do that too. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of, I have very little patience for that. As, if as we had know. a hand, I'm not kidding. And this is, you know, it is what it is. It's four-handed. And it was a hand where it was aces against kings. It took 
17 minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, guys, you know, the money went in on the flop, but like, <laughs> it, it, it was always just, going in. They were, they were never, they were never decide. They were never really making decisions. Right. Right. I mean, like I guess, so you could argue like, okay, you know, if you have the King, if you have the aces, like, should I be four betting? What sizing, all that stuff. But we know that doesn't take three minutes. Yeah. We know that that's all designed to sort of, you know, get people off the scent. Because here's the thing. The truth is this. And if you play online poker, you know this. Timing tells are a thing. Yeah. They are real, right? So, you know, I understand why people want to balance them to a certain degree. But there, there is a point where it becomes like, you know, egregious. And you have like 17-minute hands with aces against kings. Hang on my, a second. My thought, my thought on this tweet. Wait, 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 wait. It was a 17-minute hand with the money going in on the flop? Yeah. Yeah. Again, there's no clock, right? So it was like a it was like a four bet pot pre, right? Yeah, and then it was like a check raise and all in on the flop, right? So like, let's say it takes the first guy like you know forty five seconds to open or something like that. The next guy takes like two and a half minutes to three bet, and then the aces. I don't know if they four bet or they just moved called before the flop, but they took like three four minutes. And then the flop came out and the first guy thought for like 45 seconds and checked. And the other guy waited for about a minute. And I mean, you can get up to 17 minutes real fast. I mean, if, the, you know, um, but I, the thing that when I read this tweet, it was that I was thinking was we have to destigmatize calling the clock too. And I know, you know, we talked about this early in the show and Daniel says, you know, it shouldn't be on the players, you know, the, the rules make it so that it's on the players and it's very arbitrary. And that's what sucks. I agree with that hundred percent. On the other hand, that's the system we have now in a perfect world. It's not going to work though, Terrence. You know, you know, it's not going to work for so many reasons. Number one, different personality types, right? Some people are just don't like confrontation. Well, we They're have to, de- de- no, then what I'm right. saying is what so I'm getting to is we have to destigmatize two, it. We have to make it so that it's not a right. bad thing. So that if you call the clock on me, I'm not personally offended. I, I don't think, think fucking Daniel's an asshole. I have to no, think. But we've, we've tried to do that for years. And some people just have that feeling. But the bigger problem with it is this. It's like, you're my friend. I won't call the clock on you, but I don't like you. So I'm going to call the clock on you. You sure. know, what I mean? like, yeah, it's just the bottom line is this. It's so, first of all, we don't know how to define a reasonable amount of time. You know, it should not be on the players to decide these types of things when a clock is called. Let's just make the rules better. Golf figured it out. Golf, I'm sorry, um, uh, basketball figured it out. All right, well, we got to do something because the ball's not going to move unless we create a, some sort of time impetus. Chess realized, okay, well, if we don't put time pressure on these guys, these guys can like just sit there for a week and make their moves and they'll just play perfectly. So how do we improve the game, right? And we're at that stage with poker. And we've already, like I said, for the most part in the high rollers, we've done that. But here's the thing. You still run into Mikita Bajikowski, right, who almost in every situation takes the full 30 seconds. That's still too long. Mm -hmm. You know, if if two guys do that, if two guys take the full 30 seconds, you know, you're looking at seven-minute hands, five, six, seven-minute hands, where, you know, I think reasonable amount of hands, because there should be enough no-limit hands, especially shorthanded where it goes raise, full, 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 raise, full, full, full. Those hands take 30, 40 seconds. So the average should be around two minutes a hand total. That's like 30 hands an hour. That's the thing. I, t- I totally agree with you on the chess clock thing and that, that there has to be something done institutionalized, but we also have to make it clear. I think especially to sort of amateur and recreational players that calling the clock is not an offensive thing to do and that you should not be offended if somebody does it to you and you should not think that somebody is going to be mad and offended. We have to destigmatize. Now you're bringing facts to a feelings fight, right? You're <laughs> I mean, right. Well, you stop bringing these facts to a feelings fight. That's not how I feel about it. So you're wrong. You know what I mean? I mean it's just, it's not a personal attack. If you call the clock on somebody or they call the clock on you, it's well, just, think it's about a it. thing. I know it isn't. I know it isn't, but it can easily per- be perceived as this. Look at it this way, right? I'm on my case money. I'm in a tournament. I have the decision for my tournament life, right? It's super important to me. This Everything's riding on it. I'm doing the thing. And you fucking Terrence say clock. And I'm like, excuse you, me? I'm like, you asshole, dude. Don't you know how much this means to me? How important this is? How dare you? I didn't take that long. It's only been a couple minutes. And then the fight begins where there's animosity. Even though, Terrence, you did nothing wrong, right? The way that person feels in the moment is something that you can't control. Like I had... Tobias Rankemeyer upset with me. I called the clock at 10 minutes in the, it was a $1 million buy-in and it was a turn and he had aces on like a queen jack board and Scott was bluffing with, with King 10. Um, but I literally waited 10 minutes and then I said clock and he like said, you know, you calling clock affected my decision and that's what made me make the wrong play. I'm like, I mean, you can be mad at me, but, and I know that you, people can't help their emotion. And when someone specifically calls the clock on you, people just are not, People, humans have these uh, uh, visceral responses right away where they're like, fuck that guy. Yeah. 
Too bad. Just, All right. Never happened to me. I never been mad at anybody for calling the clock on me, but then it doesn't happen very often. Either. <laughs> I had a guy once, Chris Oliver, I swear to God, it was so funny to me. And I saw him do this, luckily, because I was covering one of his streams and I saw him call clock early. On. He literally, he moved in on the river in like five seconds. He goes, clock. <laughs> <laughs> What the, literally five seconds. I was like, clock, really? And I was like, okay. I think I do remember having the clock called to me once and it was pre-flop and it was like eight or nine years ago. And I was like, whoa, really? Have I been slow? Like I panicked. Like I was just like, oh, really? Like I didn't think I was really being slow. I was, like, I was just like, this has never happened to me. Wow. Uh, all right, uh, let's move on. So um, last show, we talked about giving away one of our NFTs, and this is, uh, I know we're going to, but I've butchered this every, I've, I've called it something different every podcast, but I'm going to do it again. It is upside down flag, top left corner, orange background. I, I think I probably butchered it again. <laughs> That's the general name. It's in the vicinity of the name of the, of our NFT that Daniel uh, minted, 12 of them. Um, we've, we have six that are currently uh, held by, uh, for uh, each of us has one and then we've given two away. We have six more to give away. So we thought about, well, what's the way, best way to give these things away? We've done, you know, five-star reviews. Now we're going to give away one as per our last show to the best idea uh, for giving one of these away. And we got some ideas in the chat. I had to go read all of the chat, which was painful. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, uh, I did YouTube I, comments is what you're referring so to, the YouTube which, is, comments, yeah. which is, I yeah. agree. YouTube comments are, are fantastic. You should leave lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the white Asian guy who thinks he's smart was, uh, was one of them. It's um, usually, you, that's one that, that's every week. They're just copy pasting that one. <laughs> uh, all right. So I picked out four and I've, you know, rather than just pick one, why don't we go through these and maybe pick two? To, to sort of get two birds with one stone here, we have six to give away. Why don't we give two away to two of these four entrants and I'll, uh, I'll throw these out to the group and we can throw them around. One of them is a uh, Darren Doyle tweets, uh, next giveaway, how about a free roll GG poker tournament with a password, which sounds like a great idea, right? We could get a whole bunch of people um, to play a friendly tournament. Maybe GG will add some money for new accounts, et cetera. Um, and first prize could include uh, one of the NFTs. Uh, Daniel, is this something that we can maybe do in like beginning of January where, where we can uh, schedule it and get people to put it in their schedules? We will look into it, sir. We will look into it. Okay. So that's going to be uh, something that we think about. Uh, the next one was Arnold uh, is knit fold. Uh, <laughs> you should give away NFTs to the person who can provide the best location idea for Daniel's RV at Bally's <laughs> along with other lo logistics. For the World Series of Poker. This is a great idea, right? This is crowdsourcing your solution, Daniel. The problem is I don't know how we're going to be able to arbitrate what the best response is. But well, it's Daniel's opinion, right? Whatever yeah. is the best solution. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so that's one. Uh, Stu G writes, uh, NFT giveaway should go to the best remix of the MJ uh, <laughs> um, clip. <laughs> Get a beat going, maybe some auto-tune, make some magic things happen. Fantastic idea. That's my personal favorite. Yeah. Just so I can play it for MJ, where somebody uh, turns his uh, video into a into a. I've, mix. I've thought I've thought about trying to do that as Ross well. Ross is already on top of it. He's gone down the road. I love but it. It's, uh, yeah. I'm sure we have some talented, you know, musician producer yeah. listeners. Yeah. Grant writes uh, NFT contest submission: best fake Canadian hockey talk. I like this one. Okay. That would be good. People can just record voice memos of their best Canadian accents and and send yeah. them to the to the show email. Right. So no, the email the email. So what is the uh, voicemail? Right? Oh yeah, the voicemail too. You what can do that. Number? Can you put it up on the screen, maybe uh, for people to do? But uh, Daniel, off the top of your head, which two of those are your favorite? Oh, uh, am I picking? No, we're all picking. I like the best fake Canadian hockey talk. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how anyone's going to give me. And then I, I guess I like Darren Doyle's, the GG tournament. The GG tournament. Okay. Terrence, your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I of these, I definitely like the, the free roll uh, idea the best. I mean, I like a, I like a little game of skill. I like a little community involvement. Even if we can't quite make that happen expeditiously, I still think yes, that's yes. the best idea. That's my vote. I want to throw one in for the field. Cause I was sort of browsing the comments while you're, I like the one, I like the one Gen X years says that the, the, the winner should be whoever can find a slogan for the Dat Poker podcast. 
um, mm. or a voicemail with the best intro. So I, I, I like to throw my vote out for the field there. I'm like, I like the idea of, of, of us having a slogan. We don't have a slogan. What would true. Slogan? How are we using a slogan? I don't understand. I don't know. You just, you just put it under a thing, whatever you put in the description. You just start every week with it. You know, <laughs> you say it right after sponsored by Daniel Grano's masterclass of poker. It is that poker podcast, the blank, blank, yeah. blank, blank, blank. Okay. So you've, you every great radio show has a slogan. Roscoe, Absolutely. Well, Roscoe, your thoughts are. I, it reminds me of another podcast I listen to where, yeah, he ends the he ends every show with like every every great radio show host has a has an outro and then just ends the show. Um, <laughs> I like, uh, yeah, I like the. Well, I want somebody to make the song, but like, but then, like and and there's a bit of a time gap. A lot of people don't know who MJ is. Even yeah, they, that's what I was thinking. I mean, it's not. But, um but yeah no i i want people to call in i want to hear show, some, so. some guy from from like mississippi trying to do a canadian accent um yes. and the by the way the the numbers up in the in the description above here it's it's in on every tile uh, and then yeah let's board. let's do a, a a free roll if we can okay so let's go with this let's go with the uh, terrence is going to lose out on his field bet we're going to do um, a free roll, a GG. And uh, I think, Daniel, if you uh, need me to look into that, I can help as well. Uh, maybe uh, early January, we can have a Well, I'm thinking we could do like club GG because that's successful. There yeah, it's good. I like it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're going to do uh, best fake Canadian hockey talk. All right. So here's what this is going to happen. You're going to call in. If you want to win an NFT from us, you've got 60 seconds to do your best fake. It can be play by play. It can be... Uh, comment on a team a player um make it good because we're gonna are, are, are actual canadians ineligible because nope. the thing is that i think it's just so much easier if you're a canadian to do fake canadian yeah. Yeah, because but, you just but you just recollect the conversation that you've like, had today <laughs> it's funnier if it sounds like you know it's foreign to you yes well, i agree I know the song going out for a rip are you bud oh yeah Yes, that's what yeah, I was going to say. That's a good way to learn. Also, just look up yes. Letter Kenny clips on YouTube. Right. Going out right. for a rip, are you, bud? <laughs> Going out for a rip. Oh, that's catchy as fuck. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, so that's going to be it. So for next show, you have between now and the next podcast to uh, call in, give us 60 seconds of your best uh, fake Canadian hockey talk, and uh, we're going to pick one of those. It's going to win an NFT. And the other one is going to be a free roll that we're going to set up. Uh, for the beginning of January. So uh, we'll take other ideas this week. If you have other ideas for uh, a giveaway for next week, uh, we'll also take those in the YouTube comments. Uh, head on over to Daniel Legrano's, uh YouTube uh, channel and, and leave the comments in the show. Give us the, the thumbs up. Give us the five-star reviews. I mean, that might be a one too, where we go back uh, maybe the 11th or 10th or 11th giveaway is going to be a five-star review. So you might as well just go do that and get a head start. Um, so do that uh, for Google um, and, or sorry, uh, for iTunes, um, mm. it is the five-star review. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for this week. Uh, no hockey talk. Uh, uh, thanks to everybody out there for listening. Thanks to you guys for getting together and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>